I'm Robert Lomas, and I'd like to talk to you about Elias Ashmold. And the subtitle for the lecture is Elias Ashmold, Warts and All, in his own words, as what he wrote it. Because the gist of this lecture is taken from Elias Ashmold's own diaries. Elias Ashmole was born in Lichfield in 23rd of May 1617, and he was the only child of a local saddler called Simon. He went on to become both a solicitor and an astrologer. He's perhaps best known for the Ashmolean Museum that he bequeathed to Oxford University. When he died in 1692, he left his library, his collection of antiquities, to Oxford University, and this bequest started the museum. Ashmole's well known to all Freemasons because there are many Masonic myths about him. For example, a little, a little leaflet, Your Questions Answered, issued by the United Grand Lodge of England in 1999, proudly, but wrongly, claims the earliest recorded making of a, free, of a Freemason in England is that of Elias Ashmole in 1646. That's not exactly true because the first Freemason made on English soil was Brother Sir Robert Murray, made in Newcastle in 1641. But how and why Ashwell came to be made a Mason at Warrington is something quite interesting. His motives seem to be far more political than many modern Masons imagine. At the age of 16, young Elias left Lichfield to move to London. He went to live with Baron James Paget, his mother's cousin by marriage. At this time he started to keep an occasional diary of contemporary events. It is from this diary that I was able to discover so much about him. By 1638 he had qualified as a solicitor and married Eleanor Mannering, a young lady from Smallwood near Warrington, whom he had met at Paget's house. She died from the complications of pregnancy on the 6th of December 1641. She had gone to Smallwood to stay with her parents for the birth and Elias only learned of her death when he travelled up to Cheshire, intending to spend Christmas with her and his in-laws. In August the following year he wrote in his diary, The troubles of London are growing great. I resolved to leave the city and retire into the country. He moved to Smallwood to live with his father-in-law, Peter Mannering. During his stay in Cheshire he still worked as a solicitor. His diary tells us that on April 1643 he travelled down to London to assist Henry Mannering, his late wife's cousin, on legal business. Ashmole shows his royalist sympathies when he records that he did not approve of how diverse statues and pictures in the Abbey Church of Westminster were pulled down and defaced by a committee of the House of Commons and members of their trained band. On the 27th of May 1643, Ashmole travelled to Oxford. He was on legal business concerned with collecting the King's excise from the town of Lichfield. Charles I, who had been driven out of London, had established his court in Oxford. Ashmole decided to join Brasenose College and stay in the city. He wanted to study natural philosophy, mathematics, astronomy and astrology. His diary is unclear about exactly how he joined Brasenose. He took great care to erase the status under which the college accepted him. Certainly there's no record of his graduating. I almost suspect him of wishing to present the appearance of graduating without actually managing to achieve the reality. BA brackets failed may be the appropriate description of his academic achievements. Indeed, he may simply have been living at the college as what is called a stranger. Ashmole's uncle by marriage was certainly a stranger at Brasenose College at this time and he sponsored Ashmole to the college. While he was in Oxford, Ashmole started to keep some of his diary in code in order to conceal its contents from parliamentary spies. He would continue this habit of secret writing throughout his life. The nature of some of his number substitution codes that show that he was well set up to produce secret coded reports of a military nature. On the 22nd of March 1645 he met Captain Wharton who was a senior officer in the King's Garrison of Oxford and also a keen astrologer. Within a month Wharton had appointed Ashmole as one of the four masters of ordnance of the city. Towards the end of August after his defeat at Naysbury, Charles I returned to Oxford. 
Ashmole notes that the king stayed from the 28th to the 30th of August, before leaving the city to its fate. By September, Ashmole was working on the defence of the city against the expected parliamentary attack. On the 17th of September, 1645, he wrote in his diary, This afternoon, Sir John Hyden, Lieutenant of the Ordnance, began to exercise my gunners in Maudling Meadows. This note was written in cipher, so Ashmole was already covering his back against possible denouncement to Parliament. By the end of 1645, Ashmole was Commissioner of Excise at Worcester, in addition to his military role. He kept the letter that he took to Worcester on the 22nd of December 1645, and it reads, The bearer, one of the gentlemen of ordinance of the garrison of Oxford, having an employment in your lordship's government by the Parliament here put upon him, out of his desire to be known and serviceable to your lordship, has entreated my mediation and attestation to whose person, industry and merits during the time he has been interested in his majesty's service under my survey, I can recommend him to your lordship's favour as an able, diligent and faithful man, wherein your lordship may be pleased to believe. That letter was written to Lord Jacob Astley, commander of the king's forces in the counties of Hereford, Worcester and Stafford. It was signed by Sir John Hayden, who had been so impressed when he exercised Ashmole's troops on Maudlin Meadows. Ashmole arrived in Worcester two days before Christmas. He was sworn in as Commissioner of Excise for the town on the 27th of December 1645. He lost no time in ingratiating himself with the local bigwigs, dining with Lords Biriton and Astley to present his letter of recommendation. He proudly recorded in his diary that he had also met Sir Gilbert Gerard, the then Royalist Governor of Worcester. During January, Ashmore was involved in helping Lord Astley prepare his forces to march to relieve Chester. Ashmole continually cast horoscopes trying to predict the course of the war and its likely consequences for himself. He was also interpreting his dreams to see if he could foretell the future. He recorded a dream in April that the King was marched out of Oxford and became worried about its meaning. On the 27th of April he recorded in his diary that he had dreamed the King went from Oxford in disguise to the Scots. This is one of the few accurate astrological predictions Ashmole made, as Charles would leave Oxford and surrender to the Covenanters at Newark. By that time, Ashmole was closely involved in the Royalist cause. He'd bought himself a number of new and fashionable outfits to impress his sponsors and various ladies he'd met. Also, he had succeeded in persuading Lord Astley to transfer his military commission from, from Hayden's gar Oxford garrison to the one at Worcester. On the 12th of March, 1646, he wrote in his diary, I received my commission of a captainship in the Lord Ashley's regiment. By the 22nd of May, 1646, Ashmole was appointed Master of Ordnance at Worcester, and by the 18th of June he wrote in his diary that Colonel Washington met me at Seven Bridge and told me he was much beholding to me that I would take upon me this command and that I should do the king good service now he has so much waned. The king soon waned even further. Oxford fell on the 20th of June, leaving only Lichfield and Worcester holding out for the crown. Ashmore recorded the fall of Lichfield to Parliament on the 14th of July 1646, and ten days later he wrote, Worcester was surrendered, and thence I rode out of the town according to the articles, and I went to my father Mannerings in Cheshire. This is confirmed by the calendar of state papers, where Captain Ashmole is described as being among the officers who surrendered. Worcester was the last garrison town to hold out for the King's cause, and its fall signalled the end of the hopes of Charles I. As a royalist officer, Ashmore was forbidden to live within the bounds of the city of London, and so was unable to earn his living by the practice of law. He went to the house of his dead wife's father in Cheshire, because he had nowhere else to go. Ashmole had picked the wrong side of the Civil War, and by late 1646 he was out of a job and out of political favour. Small wonder that he kept casting horoscopes to see if his luck would improve, if he could safely travel to London, or if he would marry a wealthy widow. Almost any wealthy widow would have done, 
Mrs. Cole, Mrs. Minshall, Mrs. Island, Mrs. Thornborough, Mrs. March, Lady Fitton, or Lady Mannering, all figure in the erotic and pecuniary dreams that the 29-year-old Ashmole recorded during this period. His diary entries show him to be an inconsiderate and outrageous flirt as he tries to bring about a speedy marriage to help fill his lean purse. Typical of his entries are these examples of his dalliances with Lady Bridget Thornborough, Mrs. Wall, and finally Mrs. March, none of whom would consent to marry him. I quote from Ashmole, The Lady Thornborough sent for me, and I went to her and found her in bed. Mrs. Thornborough lay upon a bed with me, and exercised some love to me, and that she really did love me. I felt her, I can't use this word, it starts in C and ends in T, and it seemed to be closed up. That night, from ten to twelve, I discoursed with Mrs. Wall in her bedchamber, where still all her discourse beat upon her fear that she should not marry me to please her friends. He also wrote of Mrs. March, who had consented to come undressed to him while he was still in bed, saying, I had this day diverse kisses from her, and she lent me her picture to wear next to my heart. She then put her hand into bed to me, and protested she had never done so much since her, since her husband died, and she told me she hoped I was confident there was nothing she could afford me, but that I might command it. Despite his romantic efforts, Ashmole didn't persuade any of these wealthy widows to marry him. He was forced to consider other means of making his living. The articles of surrender he'd signed obliged him to either return to his home or go overseas and never bear arms any more against the Parliament of England or do anything willfully to the prejudice of their affairs. While he was trapped in besieged Worcester, his mother had died. The wealthy Lady Thornborough had just refused his offer of marriage, and so his only remaining family was the father of his late wife, Mr. Peter Mannering of Smallwood, Cheshire. Ashmole scratched a living carrying out simple legal duties for his father-in-law, but he became highly stressed. On the 16th of December, 1646, he was feeling very sorry for himself. He started to develop boils on his arms, and then things got worse. He confided to his diary, This night I first perceived a boil to rise upon my arse. His joints ached, he was extremely constipated, and became so concerned that he started to record the number of stools he passed each day. He continually cast new horoscopes, asking if he should get a fortune by a wife, without pains and easily. Though what rich widow would want a constipated outcast with an enormous boil on his backside is a question he avoided asking the stars. He must have wondered about his attractiveness as a husband, however, as he also cast horoscopes asking if he would fare better if he went overseas. The young Ashmole was certainly ambitious, and not shy of currying favour, if he thought it would help his fortunes. And he suddenly seems to have resolved the question of what to do next. On the 17th of October, he borrowed some money from his cousin, Colonel Henry Mannering, and he bought a horse from Congleton Horse Fair. On the 20th of October, he gathered his possessions together, and by the 25th of October was on his way to London, despite the undertaking he'd given at Worcester not to live in the capital. He evidently believed that he would now be allowed to ignore the restraining order he had received as Master of Ordinance at the surrender of the city. This belief was well founded, because on the 20th November 1646 he was living in London and mixing freely with astrologers, alchemists and mathematicians. Among these was William Lilly. Lilly was a well-established astrologer, writer of the much-respected university textbook on Christian astrology, and a strong supporter of Parliament. Just what had happened to change Ashmole's fortunes and make him acceptable to a man like this? The only material difference was that his cousin, Colonel Henry Mannering, had introduced Ashmole to a lodge of Freemasons meeting in Warrington. Ashmole had been made a Mason on the afternoon of the 16th of October, 1646. This membership of the craft was the key to meeting many influential people and allowing him to move to London despite the law. Indeed, a note in the papers of the Public Record Office, State Papers Domestic, Interregnum A, confirms the unlawful nature of his move to London when it says, Ashmole doth make his abode in London notwithstanding the Act of Parliament to the contrary. Ashmole had changed overnight. He went from a despairing outcast, suffering from constipation, aching joints, repeated failures in love and boils on his bum, to being an enthusiastic and bold adventurer, who was accepted in London society. The only change in his status was that he was now a Freemason. 
I suspect he became a Freemason to open doors for him at the highest levels in parliamentary London. Unfortunately, his diary entry only says where, when and with whom he became a Mason. It doesn't explain why he wanted to join the craft. His diary entry for the 16th of October, 1646, reads, 4.30pm. I was made a Freemason at Warrington in Lancashire with Colonel Henry Mannering of Cartersham in Cheshire. The names of those that were then of the lodge were Mr. Richard Penkert, Warden, Mr. James Collier, Mr. Richard Sankey, Mr. Henry Littler, Mr. John Ellum, Mr. Richard Ellum, and Mr. Hugh Brewer. The men making up the lodge were mainly local landowners, who would have been well known to the Mannering family. Masonic historian Dudley Wright says of this meeting, The proceedings at Warrington in 1646 established some very important facts in relation to the antiquity of Freemasonry and to its character as a speculative science. The term warden, moreover, which follows the name of Richard Penker, will of itself remove any lingering doubt whether the Warrington Lodge could boast a higher antiquity than the year 1646, since it points with the utmost clarity to the fact that an actual meeting of a subsisting branch of the Society of Freemasons was present at the meeting. This is evidence that Freemasonry was active not only in Scotland but also in England during the 1640s. Among the Masons present at Ashmole's initiation, there are two of particular interest. The first is Richard Sankey, the father of the Freemason who transcribed the Sloan manuscript. This document is one of the English copies of the ancient charges which had developed from the Shaw Statutes. It records the duties and privileges of a Freemason and gives an outline of what Freemasonry is about. Richard Sankey's son Edward dated his signed copy of the ancient charges October 1646. This was the same month that Ashmole was made a Mason. The philosophy of Freemasonry which Robert Murray had brought from Scotland was also familiar to the warden who initiated Elias Ashmold. Ashmole must have been through a similar ceremony to the one Robert Murray had taken part in five years earlier in Newcastle. The second interesting character in the Warrington Lodge is Hugh Brewer. He had been a captain in the Royalist Army of James Stanley, Earl of Derby. Brewer had fought with Stanley against the parliamentary forces of Lord Berriton to defend Warrington for Charles I. He seems a strange choice to share a lodge with Henry Mannering, a serving colonel of the parliamentary army. What is noticeable about the membership of this lodge is that they are drawn from both sides of the Civil War. A roundhead colonel and two royalist captains, as well as a number of local landowners from Warrington, Newtley, Wirrows and Lim, whose politics we don't know. Once he was in the craft, Ashmore was revitalised. He stopped drifting and immediately started to prepare to move back to London. His astrological inquiries, as recorded in his diary, show he had been afraid to contemplate such a move before his initiation. What had he learned from the Freemasons of Warrington? Perhaps a useful list of parliamentary contacts in London and how to approach them. Ashmore's official biographer, C. H. Justin, says of this time, Perhaps his newly acquired Masonic connections had influenced Ashmole's decision. Certainly, on his return to London, his circle of friends soon included many acquaintances, among astrologers, mathematicians and physicians, whose mystical learning might have predisposed them to membership of speculative lodges. This new circle of friends revolved around William Autry, the mathematician, alchemist, astrologer and inventor of the slide rule, who had tutored Elias at Oxford. Among Autry's friends were Seth Ward, Jonas Moore, Thomas Henshaw, Christopher Wren, William Lilly, George Wharton and Thomas Ward. Also, within a year, Ashmore became a regular visitor to Gresham College, the institution which was so important as a meeting place for the founder members of the Royal Society. By the 17th of June, 1652, Ashmore was so well established in London that he was visited by two important supporters of Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell. These were John Wilkins and Christopher Wren. At this time, Wilkins was a successful parliamentarian academic. He was warden of Wadham College and was courting the sister of Oliver Cromwell, Rabina, who he would later marry. Ashmole wrote in his diary, 11am, Dr. Wilkins and Mr. Wren came to visit me at Blackfriars. This was the first time I saw the doctor. Wren had just been appointed a fellow of All Souls Cambridge. Both Ashmole's visitors enjoyed the patronage of the Cromwell family. 
What had encouraged these two successful academics to visit a disgraced royalist ex-officer living illegally in London? I suspect it was his becoming a Freemason that explains why they decided to visit Ashmole. John Wallace was a friend of Wilkins, an early member of the Royal Society and also a friend of William Ortrid. And I knew that Ortrid was at the centre of a group of men, many of whom became founders of the Royal Society. Ortrid was never invited to become a member, quite simply because he died before the first meeting. But Ortrid helped Ashmole out by giving him lodgings during the difficult times before the Restoration. Soon after arriving in London, Ashmole wrote in his diary, About a fortnight or three weeks after I came to London, Mr Jonas Moore brought me acquainted with Mr William Lilly. It was on a Friday night, and I think the 20th of November. Jonas Moore was at the time tutor in maths to the 14-year-old James, Duke of York. The Duke of York had been handed over to Parliament at the surrender of Oxford the previous year. Moore's appointment had been agreed by both Parliament and the King. William Lilly made a living writing almanacs of astrological forecasts. He was a sort of mystic meg of his day. He wrote under the pen name of the English Merlin. He was also a royalist and a supporter of Charles I, but he tried not to quarrel with Parliament. In June 1647, only nine months after being made a mason, Ashmole was asked by William Lilly to create an index for his textbook, Christian Astrology. At the time, this was widely used in university teaching. True to form, Ashmole cast a horoscope for the best time to start the work, and fixed on a time ten minutes after twelve noon on the fifth day of the month. Stars must have smiled on Ashmole, because his association with Lilly increased his status in the Scientific Society of London. Moore and Lilly were Freemasons, which is why Ashmole sought them out soon after he joined the craft. Now he had knew from his brethren in the North how to identify himself to his brethren in London. Unfortunately, he did not write down his motives in the way he did with his intentions of remarrying. Ashmole's diary is not the detailed daily record of his thoughts and life that Samuel Pepys left behind. It's more a series of jottings about his business and military affairs. He discusses his attempts to marry and quotes a number of Masonic dedications, yet he only twice mentions going to Masonic meetings. Other contemporary writers report that he started to write a complete history of Freemasonry, where he may well have talked about his attitudes to the craft, but unfortunately this work was destroyed by the Duke of Sussex when he modernised the Library of the Royal Society. Certainly Ashmole wasn't afraid to advertise his new status in the craft. He blatantly used Masonic symbols on the frontispieces of his books, and he publicly accepted many Masonic dedications and tributes. What other reason, apart from Masonic preferment, could have persuaded the influential Ortred to meet with this disgraced ex-officer and failed academic? Who around Ortrid were Freemasons? I looked more closely at his new friends. I started with statements made by a senior member of that circle, the mathematician John Wallace, the man who discovered algebra. John Wallace was a friend of Seth Ward, and Wallace had written that the Royal Society had started with a series of meetings held in Gresham College about the year 1645. These meetings he had described as being held under Masonic conditions, which forbade the discussion of religion and politics. Here I repeat exactly his words. Our business was, preluding matters of theology and state affairs, to discourse and consider philosophical inquiries. Among the many members of the Royal Society Wallace mentioned as attending these meetings, he singled out the name of John Wilkins as important. Ashmole arrived in London around the end of October 1646, and by the 20th of November he was welcomed into William Ortrid's circle after being reintroduced to him by William Lilly, whom Ashmole had met through Jonas Moore, yet another man who had become a founder of the Royal Society. Within three months Ashmole was asked to attend a meeting of mathematicians at Gresham College on the 16th of February 1647, which John Wallace also attended. The mystical leanings of Ashmole's new friends did predispose them to membership of speculative lodges, and many of them belonged to the craft. Ashmole says in his diary for the 11th of March 1682 that he received a summons to appear at a lodge to be held the next day at Mason's Hall, London. Present at that lodge was William Hammond. William Hammond was a fellow of the Royal Society. 
He'd been proposed on the 23rd of January 1661, within a month of the first meeting. Hammond had translated many of Wallace's Latin works into English, and so had worked closely with John Wallace for many years. Ashmore's diary confirmed that Hammond had been a member of the craft. From this clue, I discovered that many of the group that John Wallace was mixing with between 1645 and 1648 were Freemasons, and they were the group who welcomed the disgraced Brother Ashmole in 1646 when he became a Freemason. Their use of Masonic dedications to Ashmole confirms this view, so perhaps it's not surprising that they were following Masonic rules and adopting Masonic philosophy for their meetings. Perhaps these meetings really were lodge meetings. All the evidence, including his own diary entries, indicates that Brother Elias saw Freemasonry as a means to an end. Just as he cold-bloodedly set out to seduce and marry any available rich widow, so he seems to have set out to join a society that would protect him if he returned to London, would provide him with a ready-made circle of useful contacts. And as his successful change in fortune shows, joining the craft certainly worked to his advantage. We remember him as the second mason to be documented as being made on English soil. But I'm sure his motive to join had more to do with making contacts than in learning to be a better citizen. But he did bequeath his collections to set up the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. So perhaps the craft did succeed in making him a better man. The material for this lecture is taken from the book Freemasonry and the Birth of Modern Science, which covers Ashmole's role in the creation of the Royal Society. Thank you, brethren. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.